let's recall a bit what we did last time with three slides. So we um, sort of got the motivation for this entire part of the course was what do we do with the parameters in our probabilistic models? If we decided to do probabilistic modeling, so we assign probability measures to variables and then try to compute posteriors, we invariably still find parameters in our model. There are still just some choices we have to make, and we don't really want to think about them, or we have to because otherwise the model doesn't make sense, so how do we set them? Well, ideally, we would like to do full Bayesian inference. We marginalize out the variables that are part of the inference, and then that yields a likelihood, that's the evidence in the, in the normalization constant of Bayes' theorem, which we can treat as a likelihood for the model or for the parameters. But that usually involves intractable integrals. If it didn't, we would probably just treat these variables as part of the variables or these parameters as variables. And so instead, we need some other procedure for optimizing these parameters. One simple thing is to just construct a Laplace approximation in the parameter space. Um, and that allows us to optimize parameters, but not on the actual model likelihood, but on an approximation to it. And we saw as an alternative this algorithm called EM, expectation maximization, which is not something we can always do but which in certain cases where we are able to construct certain kind of probability distributions can be used to quite efficiently optimize evidences. And it works as follows. The thing we need to be able to compute is the expectation of, sorry, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> so we want to maximize this thing, which is the evidence. So this here is the marginal over the latent variables under the model parameterized by theta for the data x. If we integrate out z, then we're left with a likelihood for theta, which we can then deal with. So we assume we can't do this integral very easily. So instead, we consider, well, initially, and this isn't even on the slide, we initially consider just computing the expected value, so the integral over the log of this marginal, uh, over this joint distribution under the posterior for the latent variable z. And we saw that this can be written more generally as um, computing what we call an evidence lower bound, so a quantity, an elbow, a quantity that is strictly less than this term up here, where the difference between this quantity and this quantity is the kullberg leibler divergence between Q and the true posterior P of Z. So what we do is we iteratively set Q to this posterior under a particular choice of parameters, then compute this expected value. Because this is the optimal choice, in some sense, we maximize this evidence lower bound in Q, and then we maximize it in theta. And we iterate between maximizing in Q and maximizing in theta. And those two iterative steps amount to some kind of coordinate ascent in, uh, between parameters and posterior, like computer posterior, update the parameters, computer posterior, update the parameters. And um, we did this as an example on uh, last Thursday for this Gaussian mixture model. So I showed you this textbook example of this Geyser data, an old faithful Geyser in um, Yellowstone National Park, which has a kind of cluster structure. There are two groups of data points in this two-dimensional data set. And uh, we can represent these two, these, this sort of structure of the probability distribution by a model that, in, as a graph, looks like this, and as an equation, looks like this. So we assume that for each datum, there's a decision being taken at random to put it into one uh, cluster or, the, or, or another cluster, or actually one out of k clusters. Um, that, that identity of the cluster is assigned to a latent variable called ZNK. So that's the identity of the cluster for the nth datum. And then when we know which cluster we're drawing from, we look up the parameters of the cluster. This is sometimes called the base distribution. Um, in this case, it's a Gaussian with a mean and a covariance, and then draw from that cluster. But we don't know which data point belongs to which cluster, nor do we know what the parameters of those clusters are. 
So the thetas now are mu and pi and sigma, and the latent quantity z are the identities of the clusters, which data point is in which cluster. So we did the derivation for this, and last time I didn't show you the, the, the Python code for it. Here it is. So this is an actual code that works, this time not in JAX, but just using NumPy um, and uh, uh, a, a function from SciPy. I should have probably added a line for this. So this is the SciPy multivariate normal um, to just iterate between. So this is kind of what the algorithm looks like. We, we say how many clusters we're going to use, two. We figure out what the shape of the data set is. We initialize the parameters of the distribution. So there's these three, pi, mu, and sigma, which are the parameters. So those together make up theta. And then there is r, which is the parameters that describe the postivia on z. Because z is a set of binary random variables. So they are assigned a discrete probability distribution. It's just an array that contains numbers between 0 and 1, such that each row of this array sums to 1. Those things are initialized in R. Um, so far, we don't need them yet, so we can just initialize them with a zero matrix. It's just basically memory allocation. It's not actually a correct estimate yet. But then in the very first step, um, in the E step, we compute this, these uh, quantities that tell us what to set R to from the, from the math. So this is the expectation step. We're computing the expected value of the latent quantity z. Why is this called the expectation step? Because r, for a discrete distribution, literally is the expected value of z. Once we have computed this, we can then maximize the parameters of uh, the, sorry, not the, not the parameters. We can, we could, we can, yeah, we can find them the, the, uh, iteratively, like per, for each different part of the parameter space, the maximally likely assignments under this postivia for the parameters pi and mu and sigma. And we do this here, um, which is an update that we derived last, last week. So I didn't show you the math again. And then we just let this run. So notice that this is just a while loop. We just let it run forever until nothing changes anymore. So we could measure how nothing changes anymore in different ways. We could, we could measure whether mu changes, or sigma changes, or r changes, or all three of them together. We could also compute the elbow itself. That's just a number, and we could just watch it rise. It's actually a good idea often, but I didn't want to add the extra line here. Why? Because then it's sort of a sanity check. You can see if it goes up. If it doesn't go up, you've done something wrong. Either you've misimplemented the elbow, or you're not actually optimizing. Um, so this has to rise in every single step until it doesn't rise anymore, and then we just stop. So this is a way to fit parameters of a model, theta. But it requires us to be able to compute this posterior distribution over the latent quantities. So what do we do if we can't compute this in closed form? Like here, this, this Gaussian mixture model maybe also seemed very constructed. It's this very specific choice of things so that everything just works out with this tiny little data set. So if you want to have a powerful framework that works on general data sets and that we can sort of apply not just to waiting times at a geyser, but whatever you want to do, then maybe we have to think about where we can sort of cut a few corners to build a more general framework. And this is what the entire lecture today will be about. So the idea is, let's look back at EM and see, ah, so what we did in EM was we noticed that we can write the log marginal distribution for the data under the model, P of x. Notice that this is essentially a constant. It's just how likely the data is under the model. Like we've integrated out all the variables. And we can write this as a sum of two terms. The elbow, the evidence lower bound, which is this integral over some distribution q, log of joint over q, minus, sorry, plus, I'm sorry, plus, yeah, because the minus is part of the definition, plus the KL divergence between this q and the true posterior p of z. And what we've constructed is we've repeatedly chosen in EM to choose the optimal Q, the one that makes this second term zero 
and then use this function of the model to update this thing, to make it, to make it increase. But if we can't construct the posterior, maybe we can use the same framework to construct an approximate distribution, Q, that somehow gets us close to the posterior. So there's a thing here that measures how close we are for a particular Q to P. And if we manage to ch find a Q that makes this zero, we found the correct posterior P. And that's sort of a tantalizing thought. There's this thing that measures how close you are to what, what you want to have. So it's like a loss, right? You want to be close to this. Maybe we can f somehow, in Q space, optimize Q so that it gets very close to p of z given x. And then that would be a way to approximately do full Bayesian inference. And maybe we can do it such that we manage to do it even if the full posterior p of z given x is not, not actually tractable. Well, that's maybe the thought. We don't yet know whether we can actually do it. But um, let's think about it. And this is the idea behind an entire very powerful framework of approximate probabilistic machine learning called variational inference that has been studied for decades now, and um, at least for a while, used to be very popular. Right now, the last two or three years, it's fallen a little bit behind again. Maybe it'll come back in a few years, and I'll make a case on Thursday why I think it might be useful to still learn about these kind of tools. So notice, first of all, before we understand how we actually do it, we first understand, try to understand why this is a cool thing to do. The cool thing about this is that these two quantities here, both the elbow and the KL divergence, they are what you could call functionals. So they are functions of a function. They take in not values of x and z, but q. q is a distribution. It's this infinite dimensional object. And then they deal with them through integration. Integration is a way of dealing with infinite dimensional objects. It's an infinite sum, effectively. And so there are statements about very general objects, just a probability distribution, that are in some sense sensitive to any choice we make about Q. And so this is an approximation in function space that we're trying, or this is a way to potentially construct an approximation in function space. So here's the, oh, actually I have a slide for this, right? So in general, we, we, we've sort of written down a way to describe how far a particular Q is from the correct thing we're trying to compute, the posterior distribution for Z given X. And if we had a very, very powerful language, we could somehow yeah, just use this loss called KL divergence to somehow optimize Q until we've reached a point where it's actually zero, and then we would know for sure that we found the correct posterior. But of course, probably we won't be able to do that, because if we could, well, then maybe we could just construct the true posterior in the first place. So what we kind of expect is that we won't actually be able to construct the correct Q, but that we somehow find a way to get close to it. And now your first, maybe actually, yeah, I think this is why I had a separate slide. I wanted to ask you what to do, right? And maybe your first kind of knee-jerk reaction is, ah, deep neural network, right? I'm just going to build a big, really big network, and I'm going to parameterize it with some weights, and then I'm just going to compute this elbow and just make it go down, right? And then I'll have a good approximation. And actually, eh, maybe that's something you can do. Maybe we'll talk about it briefly for a slide on Thursday. But actually, that's not the interesting um, approach. And it's, it can actually be sort of bad for several reasons. So a first thing you might notice is that that means you have to parameterize the distribution. And it feels like we're throwing away this beautiful mathematical aspect of this KL divergence, that it's a functional, that it operates on function space. Wouldn't it be nice to stay in function space as long as, as, long as possible and not just directly jump into a weight space where we just have to optimize a bunch of floating point numbers? And the other thing is that um, just because you parameterize something doesn't mean you can actually compute the quantity you care about. So to compute this these two terms, L or the KL divergence, um, we need to compute integrals over Q. 
So notice that so I've written down both because, of course, you can do the same. You can sort of describe this process in terms of both of these quantities. You could either say, I'm trying to make this thing zero, or you could say, I'm trying to maximize this thing. Because the two together, sum together, give a constant, p of x, or log p of x, actually. So if we maximize this thing, then we, we equivalently minimize this thing. Or if we minimize this thing, we're equivalently maximizing this thing. But both of these are integrals. So if we decide to use a neural network to minimize this loss, or this, maximize this one, then, well, we need to somehow deal with these integrals. And you can maybe guess that, nah, OK, what people then do, if you really decide that you want to use a neural network, is you, you somehow give up on the integrals. Either, either you find some magical language in which you can always, always solve the integrals in closed form. That's probably going to be a relatively restricted space of functions. So this is actually connected to some ideas that exist in non-parametric Bayesian modeling. Or you just say, ah, I'm just going to approximate these uh, integrals in some way. I'm just going to draw some samples, do some Monte Carlo approximations, and uh, it'll just have to work somehow. And uh, that's the, the idea behind um, various approximate forms of variational inference. But what we'll do today is actually, and this is maybe a little bit anachronistic, is to say, let's see if we can keep optimizing Q without breaking the idea yet that they actually are a function. And it turns out that this is connected to a super powerful idea that has been around for a really long time because it was invented by people who didn't have the luxury to take us to just ignore that there are all these challenges exist and just spin up a virtual machine with a big GPU and just you know, let it like, approximate whatever you need to approximate. So they really had to think for a long time. And what they came up with is, so OK, so we need some way of like, approximating in function space uh, Q, so a way to somehow restrict the class of functions that we can consider. Because if we don't restrict the class of functions we can consider, then, well, then we know what the optimal Q is. It's just a posterior. But we already decided that we can't compute the posterior. If we could, we would just do it. So we need to somehow find a space of functions that is a little bit less powerful than the one that P of Z given X lies in. But we want to do this in a way that doesn't yet explicitly say what that function space is. What it, that doesn't explicitly say, here's a bunch of numbers that describe the space of functions. And the idea that they came up with is absolutely ingenious. It's to say, well, so z, z is a bunch of variables, right? So typically not just one. If it's just one variable, OK, then this maybe that, that's just a one-dimensional integral. And maybe we can actually just evaluate this thing. But if it's, if it's multidimensional, then one of the challenges, one of the ways in which p of z given x can be intractable is the fact that all the z's interdepend on each other. Remember that independence and dependence are the most challenging aspects of probability theory. So what if we just said that we want q to be such that the individual elements of z are independent of each other. So if you want to, that's called factorize um, q. So we assume that q of z is a, bunch of it's a product over a bunch of distributions for some subsets of the z's, which I'm going to index with i. So in, in, of course, the most extreme case would be that every single, every single z i it's just a scalar thing, and we just factorize everything. But it could also be that the i's are over some groups in variable space, right? some, some parts of the model that you somehow want to separate from each other. So writing a product like this, as you know, means that the, 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 that's the definition of the distributions being independent of each other. And we just say that we want to have this. That's the entire idea. So we, are not, we don't say which Q we choose. We just said there's, there's going to be some distribution that we don't know yet. We'll find out later what it is. But what the one thing we want is that they factorize. Now, let's see what happens. So if the distributions factorize in this way, then let's focus on the elbow and just see what happens to it. So remember that the evidence lower bound is the integral over Q log P of joint over Q. So now we've decided that Q is a product. So we'll just plug in all those products. So on the 
this integral over Q becomes an integral over product of QIs, log of joint divided by is also minus in the log, right? So um, minus the logarithm over Q, and because Q is now a product, it becomes a sum of logarithms. I'll plug that in, and now we think about this integral for a little bit and see, okay, so we're going to have two parts here, a front part and a back part. Let's first focus on the front part. So here, let's say we pick out one particular variable, zj, that we want to deal with in one step of the algorithm. Then that one zj and, and its distribution, we can pull out of the product into the front. And then we look at this integral here, and we see that it's integral over dz1, z2, z, and so on, over all the zi's, including zj. So let's move the zj out, and let's keep the zi in. Now we have a term in here, which is actually not a simplification at all of this, from this line to this. We we'll just want to think about it in a moment. So we'll keep this around. This is going to be our operative object. And then at the back, what is happening? Well, so here we have an integral over the sum over the individual logarithms of qi, zi, over all zi. Ah, so this helps because now there is a, in every individual term of that sum, there is a big integral over a lot of set j's that are not i, or a lot of set i's that are not j, whatever, that all just don't have a term in there that matters. So they're all just integrals over probability distributions. They're all just one, lots and lots of terms of one. And um, so uh, th those just don't depend on zj. So we can kind of move them out to the back and call them a constant because they don't depend on zj. And the only term that's left in that sum is one term, the one for zj. So this is the, actually the entropy of qj of zj. That's just what this term is called. So now we can stare at this and say, ah, so what has happened now is that here there is a term inside that somehow integrates out all the individual set i's that aren't j. And then what we're left with is effectively a thing that only depends on zj. So when I say that sentence, I'm kind of dropping the fact that, of course, we have to be able to compute this integral. So now let's say we kind of suspend this belief and just say, OK, let's say we could do this integral somehow. Then if we could, then this would become a function of only set j, because all the other ones are integrated out. This is some kind of probabilistic equivalent of currying. So there's a function here, p of x and z, that depends on a lot of z's. And we somehow construct an emulator for, an, for a currying. Um, functionality, if that makes sense to you. So we integrate out its dependence on all the other variables so that we are left with something that is locally sort of frozen in z, z, zi un, unequal to j, which we can think of as a function of zj. And assume that there is some internal cool thing that takes care of all of the zi's. And then that means this thing here is actually the sort of equivalent statement to, um, to the, the derivation of the elbow for the whole distribution, but now only for set j. So this is, this is an elbow, right? It's, a, it's an expected value of q log p of x and only set j divided by log of q of set j. So there's, it's, it's like an evidence lower bound for a version of the problem where only set j exists. And so we can find its extremum, actually. Well, I have a slide for this, actually. It ex, its extremum by minimizing, minimizing KL divergence. So let me repeat what I just said. Assume you have a joint distribution with lots and lots of sets and also big data. We, um, ah, this line is stupid. We can leave it out. That doesn't really help much. So to find a good approximation, we decide that we want to factorize this distribution. The only thing we want to impose to simplify the problem is that it has to separate into individual bits that we can optimize individually. Then the, the math kind of works out such that we are left with an, an uh, evidence lower bound in each step 
that can be separated into multiple evidence lower bounds, one for each term in the factorization, which we can think about individually. And so what is the right thing to do with these evidence lower bounds? Well, we want to maximize those individual lower bounds. And we don't do this actually by computing a gradient and then setting the gradient to zero. We already know how to set the gradient to zero. We just have to make the corresponding KL divergence minimal. So we have to just set, it to, just set this thing to zero. And that means that we have to set the logarithm of qj to the expected value of the log of the joint. That's just what it means to minimize KL divergence. And what, why is this cool? So I have a big star next to it. That means it's cool. It's going to come up several times over the course of the next few minutes. Why? Because if you look at this expression with this expected value in there, this is a function of, yeah, of the data. OK, but the data is given. You don't have to worry about the data. It's just there. It's just a bunch of numbers. But it's a function of only one particular set i. The other, other ones are integrated out. But it's a function. So it's the solution to our problem. It's the correct function that maximizes the evidence lower bound for zj or minimizes KL divergence. So if we can read it off, if we manage to do the other integrals, then we can read off this function. And sometimes, if we're lucky, we can just see what the distribution is. It's just on a piece of paper. And I say piece of paper because very much this is the sort of thing you have to do on a piece of paper. It's not actually something that the computer will just do for you automatically. It requires a little bit of staring at the algebra and then figuring out what's going on. And we'll do an example today so you'll see what I mean by the staring at the, at the algebra. So this process is, uh, is also, it, there's a lot of theory that says this thing will converge because this function L minus L, uh, the negative version of it, can be shown to be convex in function space. It's, like, might not even be clear to you what it means to be convex in function space. And yeah, we don't need to talk about it. It's just convex. Are you waiting for? Uh, no, OK. Then come, on, you, come on, you have a seat if you like. So um, it will turn out that this, this optimization process will work. right? We can just, uh, it, it turns out that there is a, there's a function valued version of, of curvature, beautiful functional analysis that shows that this optimization process is, uh, problem is convex, and therefore it will converge. It's also known in physics as mean field theory. Has anyone heard of the word mean field theory before? Mm, not so many physicists in the room. OK. So then it doesn't make too much sense to talk about this. I might mention it again on Thursday. So the, the, the idea behind this is that this, was, this kind of formalism was invented by physicists who needed to construct statistical descriptions of the universe and all of its contents. And they realized that they can't actually do this if there is, even in the laws of motion of Newton, more than three bodies or more than two bodies actually interacting with each other. It's just intractable. You have to do it numerically, and they didn't have computers. But they wanted to have models for molecules with 10 to the 23 different parts. And so they came up with this beautiful idea to say, well, you could imagine that every single particle in this 10 to the 23 collection in a, in a free gas somehow um, they, they all interact with each other individually, but for them, because they keep interacting with so many different particles, it's a little bit like they are completely free, but there's just one joint field that affects all of them together and their behavior that is somehow jointly created by all of them. Like, a, like an ant colony where each ant doesn't actually care about which other ant it interacts with. All the individual ants might just be the same ant, but they somehow all interact with it. And the jointness of the entire ant colony creates this effect on them. So a particle in a molecule in a free gas doesn't actually care about which other molecule it interacts with. All the other molecules jointly create one field. And that's the average field, the expected field under all the other ones, the expected field under the interaction with all the other particles. And therefore, it's the mean field, because it's the expected, the average field. OK. so. This gives us this connection kind of creates for us an actual algorithm. From a computer science perspective, you can think about algorithms. So it creates a framework for constructing probability distributions that allow us to approximate 
a non-analytic posterior distribution over latent quantities for pretty much any distribution you might care about by minimizing an abstract object, a functional that takes in our approximation and measures how good the approximation is. So this is called the KL divergence. Of course, there are other divergences as well, but this is the one we like, um, which you want to minimize. This is the same as maximizing the elbow, because the sum of those two is equal to a constant. And this is a powerful framework. Why? Because we get to choose which kind of set of cues we want to consider. So we have a freedom to decide how rough we want the approximation to be. At the extreme end, we just write down a, basically a, a, like a single simple product of parameterized probability distributions with a bunch of parameters such that we can do the integral in the KL divergence in closed form, or we approximate the integral, and then we just run gradient descent. But actually, at the extreme other end, sometimes we are able to not even just write down what kind of space of approximations we want to be in, but only impose the fact that we want to have probability distributions that factorize into individual terms. Why factorization? Because factorization translates into iterative processes on a computer, into for loops that go through the blocks of variables and update them one after the other. It's an extremely flexible, powerful framework. I want to say this already now, at this point, that for a long time, actually, was, made, was a very promising direction within machine learning. It was studied as the, maybe the next big thing that would change everything, that would yield a very, very powerful framework. Um, not only because it's a complex optimization problem, and so it actually, like those variational approximation algorithms that exist, they actually get much closer to the kind of behavior you have come to know and love from computers than deep learning does. They just work. You have to implement them, and once they're, once they're implemented, they're just pieces of beautiful code that just work. They can be bug fixed, they can be tested, they can be deployed, they don't break, they just, they just run all the time without any, any like, drama. But, Constructing them is a very painful process. And we'll go through it now, slowly, um, so that you get to experience the pain for once. And uh, then you might understand, you might get a sense for why people might not be so keen on doing this kind of construction anymore, but also why it might actually come back at some point. And that's why I do it at the very end of this course, because it's the sort of thing that is currently a bit out of fashion. Maybe it's a bit anachronistic in 2023, this kind of way of thinking about approximate distributions. And I'll tell you a bit of the backstory on how to construct these things, um, but also maybe why it's a very powerful framework. So um, maybe at this point, some of you feel like I haven't actually told you what the algorithm is yet. I've just said something that we are going to try and do. And at least that was always my impression when I, I, I heard early, earlier on in my career a lot of introductions to variational inference. And it always felt to me like someone is not telling me what the trick is. They just have this, oh, this is a beautiful bath, and then it'll work out and we'll find the exact distribution that approximates. And I was always like, but where is the, like, how do I do it? Like, can you give me the, the rules? Because this doesn't actually say, there is no line here that says this is the approximation. Well, it's, it's sort of here, but this is too arcane, right? It's just one, like, what is this supposed to be? And that's actually maybe the main challenge of these approximations, these variational bounds, that they are very difficult to just translate into a very formal process. And as a result, they're, they're sort of the, the, the software stack for constructing them is not as rich yet, at least, as the deep learning stack. So here is what the actual practical construction of a variational bound looks like. So at the top, I've basically copied in again from the previous slides. So the first two things are the same thing as before. And now I'm telling you what, what we actually do. And then we're going, to go th we're going to go through this recipe. So the process is you write down your model. That's step number one. That's the step that was always there in probability theory and probabilistic machine learning. Always write down the probability of everything. So when someone gives you the data, 
you sit down, you write down a probability distribution, P of x given z. And often this also means drawing a little graph and kind of making yourself familiar with the distribution, thinking about it, staring at it a little bit. And then you try to figure out what's actually hard about this process that you're trying to construct, this, this the posterior distribution. What makes the integral hard for you to do, or the computing the posterior, and then impose the factorization such that the hardness goes away. And you notice that this is not really something that I can formalize mathematically. It's just you need to kind of have a mental picture of what you're trying to do. Then once you have the, the imposed factorization, this line above takes hold, and you can write down this object. So writing it down means you write this big E, this bold E, as an integral over a bunch of other distributions. And then you have a line on your piece of paper that tells you, as a function of zj, what your approximating distribution is going to be. And then you have to squint your eyes, and we'll do that together, and see what that distribution actually is that you've just constructed. And it's going to be difficult to sort of stare through the math to see the functional relationship. And that'll tell you what your approximation is. And then you go to Wikipedia, honestly, and look up all the properties of that distribution. Why? Because what you now need to do is this line, this line 2, gives you, tells you what, Z, what the distribution on Zj is, but it only tells you in terms of integrals over all the other distributions. So if you've done this process of writing out the integrals and staring at them and understanding what the distributions are that you're looking at, you can then go to Wikipedia and hope that you're able to close the loop and find for all of these individual update equations closed form expressions for what the numbers, what these integrals actually are for the corresponding approximations. And this used to be a big part of the process of machine learning. So when I did my PhD, I also got to derive a few of these variational bounds. And what we used to do is, we would just we would stand in front of the whiteboard for the bunch of people for a long time and like draw graphs and draw joint distributions and say, ah, this is something I want to model, this is something I don't want to model, and but I need that, oh, but this will, oh, there's a collider here and this will create dependence, interdependence, ah, so what are we going to do? Ah, we're going to impose factorization at that point, and then like you write down the, the, the factorization that you want, and then you go away in a lonely corner with an A3 sheet of paper in landscape with a sharp pencil, and just write down the entire thing, the log of the joint, and the integrals for the individual parts, and hope that you find some pattern. That's the, the part that the human does in this process. And for which there is some optimization available in some software stacks. So if you want to look up something, check out the infer.net platform of Microsoft. It's a little bit outdated by now, but it tries to do exactly this. But it's a bit restrictive for what you're actually allowed to do. And then uh, you need to implement it. And the implementation, of course, is also something that goes wrong, because you need to write it by hand. And then you quite often have a bug, and you just spend another two or three weeks to get it to actually work. But then when it works, it suddenly works, and you never have to worry about learning rates and uh, batch sizes, and all the other stuff. It's all just really beautiful. And you can make plots and understand what's going on. OK, so after the break, we're going to do this for our Gaussian mixture model. And how, why, why are we going to go back to the Gaussian mixture model? Well, we already saw how to fit this model using the EM algorithm to fit two clusters to this data. But there's a few things that you might be unhappy with in this particular algorithm. The first one maybe is that we have to make point estimates for pi and mu and sigma. And maybe you want to be uncertain about them. Maybe you want those to be probability distributions. Maybe you want to say that there's only three or four data points here. How can I infer five clusters from that? I wouldn't know, right? So we somehow need to be uncertain about some of these variables so that the algorithm also works if you have very sparse data. But another thing that may be even more prominent that you really may want to do is 
you, maybe you're really frustrated by this K and you don't want to set it. You want the user to have the freedom to just tell the algorithm, find out how many clusters there are for me. I don't want to tell you how many clusters there are. And to do that, we need to be uncertain about, in particular, this object up here. We need to be able to um, say to our algorithm that there might be a lot of zeros in this pi through a proper prior. And I'll tell you how to do that after the break. Let's continue at four past. So there was a really cool question about uh, this, this kind of framework that I'm sort of tempted to answer now, but actually maybe, maybe it's not the right time to do this now, but I can do this at the end of, the, of, of today's lecture, actually. It's maybe more natural to do that. Instead, I'd now like to uh, go to the actual example. So I said we're going to somehow like, pimp up this model to make, it, to make it actually much more powerful. And so here is, like, I, I realize, I mean, I can hear you moan as you get up for the break. Right? I realize that this is already a pretty complicated model. And now this is, maybe this is already a bit, a bit of a history lesson, but not from the far back history, but from like a few years ago. Up until quite recently, this was actually quite normal. Like people would stand in front of these, these like whiteboards and blackboards and draw things like this, and then they said, ha, ah, but I'm unhappy with the fact that I have to set k. What could we do with k? Ah, we need to make all of these variables. In particular, actually, if you just want to deal with k, it would be enough to just make, no, actually, we need, more, we need to make all three of these variables, otherwise it doesn't work. And so how do we make the variables? That means we need to assign probability distributions to these three dots. The dots mean that they are estimates, point estimates, not probability distributions. So we want to make them circles, empty circles, with distributions over them. And that, that requires us to say what the prior distribution over those variables is. So turning something into a probability distribution means to write down the joint. In particular, so a generative model, right? A prior for mu, for every single mu in the k copies, a prior for every sigma k, and a prior for every pi. And of course, we could write them as a joint thing, but maybe we don't need to, because this we can just keep independent from this under the prior, maybe. So what kind of distribution do we use? Ah, and this is where our toolbox actually helps, because we think about them and realize, ah, that's a probability, this is a real vector, this is a positive definite matrix. Uh-huh, we have our standard distributions for those. They're called exponential families. They are the standard conjugate priors for observations of this type that involve these quantities. So what is the, going to be the prior for, this, for a probability distribution? The Dirichlet. What's going to be our prior for the parameters of a Gaussian mean and variance if you observe data drawn from this Gaussian? That's the one that I maybe didn't spend enough time on. So that you all kind of went, uh. yeah, it's the Gaussian inverse Vichar. Boom. And you're like, oh my God. Yeah. So, but this actually is like, it's a mechanical process. Yes, it takes time to do this, but we know how to do this. We know that like, we just look at the data types. Ah, mu is a real vector, sigma is a positive definite matrix, so the prior is going to be a Vichar. Relative real vector prior is going to be a Gaussian because the Gaussian is the conjugate prior for its own mean. But actually, if you want to be jointly uncertain about mu and sigma, there is this Gauss inverse Vichar framework, which is down here, which requires us to draw a little arrow from here to here because we're actually going to jointly infer mean and variance. This is important because it's impossible to estimate the variance of a Gaussian if you don't know the mean. Why? Because the variance is literally the expected square of the numbers minus the square of the mean. So if you don't know the mean, you can't estimate the variance, right? So we're going to have some arrow pointing from sigma to mu. And then, yeah, we look up what all these distributions are uh, probably going to be. So our prior for pi is going to be a Dirichlet. Dirichlets have parameters that are called alpha. So now we have a new thing that's called a hyper prior or a hyper prior parameter, alpha, that just moves the, like, the power of the model one layer up, like one more level of abstraction. And our joint prior on mu and sigma 
is going to be this Gaussian inverse Vichar. So that's a product between a Gaussian distribution over the unknown mean of each cluster, which has a mean and an unknown variance scale, that scales the actual variance of the Gaussian, and then a Vichar prior over the inverse of this variance, because that just happens to be the right algebraic form in the exponential family sense. Why? Because the sufficient statistics of, sorry, the natural parameters of the Gaussian, remember, are the precision and the precision adjusted mean. So the inverse of sigma, the precision, which has parameters and the parameters of a Vichar, there are two of them. One is a matrix that has to be symmetric, symmetric positive definite, and the other one is a scalar called the degrees of freedom, nu, which has to be larger than d, the number of dimensions of the problem, or larger or equal to. So we just, you know, initialize those somehow, and um, that means we have now defined a new generative model for our data. It says to draw the data, do the following. First, draw a probability distribution over the clusters from a Dirichlet distribution parameterized by alpha. Dirichlet, remember from the exponential family lectures, have the, uh, the ability to actually create priors over sparse distributions. If we make the elements of alpha, of this vector alpha, less than one, then this Dirichlet puts high mass on the corners of the simplex. So it allows us to say maybe some of those elements of pi are actually zero. Maybe almost all of them are. And um, then we get sparse approximations that only use a few small number of um, components, even though they have more initialized. Then please draw a sigma for each cluster from the inverse Bichard distribution and then draw means for each Gaussian from this, uh, this thing down here, this probability distribution. Th now we have those three parameters, and now draw from a mixture model defined by those three parameters. So one sort of the, the pedestrian way of doing inference in this model is not actually not inference of generating data from this model is you run a bunch, you could write the forward pass to this model in SciPy, right? You, inst you instantiate from those models, from, from alpha and m and beta and w and nu, you instantiate these three probability distributions. Then you ask SciPy to draw from them. And then you write down uh, the probability, this generative model for the identities of each cluster. And then once you've drawn the identities of each datum to each cluster, draw the individual axis. Maybe you can convince yourself that if you didn't have the data set yet, x, you could write a piece of simple Python code using SciPy that just draws x's. That's just a pass down through this graph. And now the challenge is someone has given you an x and you want to go back up. And that's where we're going to do our variational inference. So yes, this is very tedious. It's a lot of math and lots of also of these big scary symbols in, in, uh, in those expressions. But now, Let's see if we can follow this abstract recipe and see where we get. So um, by the way, we've talked about graphs a bit and their atomic structure. So there is a really big V structure in here, a collider. All of these arrows pointing down towards our data. And the data is the thing we've seen. So remember that when you have an arrow where things collide, where the arrow heads meet, and then you condition on the variable where the arrow heads meet, everything above it becomes dependent on each other. This is explaining away. This is the story of the alarm and the burglar and so on. So now people would stare at this and say, oh, OK, this is going to be hard, right? So um, somehow we need to break this dependence. Uh, but we've already done EM. And in EM, we realized that there is this Z in there plays a very important role. So if I would only know what Z is, so if I would know which datum belongs to which cluster, then things might get easy. Why? Because if you think about it, I mean, if, if I knew, even without doing the math, I can realize that if I knew which datum belongs to which cluster, of course, I can just take the individual data and use them to do conjugate prior inference on this Gaussian. That's just an instance of conjugate prior inference for Gaussian distributions that you've already done in your uh, the seven scientists example. And of course, if I know which datum belongs to which cluster, 
then I don't, from the perspective of pi, I don't have to care about x anymore because this here is a chain graph. So if I would know this variable, then this thing, like pi, becomes independent of x given z. And of course, it's a simple instance of Dirichlet in inference. It's like the example with uh, who is wearing glasses, right? If I just observe which of my data points are in which cluster, then I can estimate how large the clusters are. So that probably means that we have to factorize our joint distribution over z, pi, mu, and sigma into a joint probability distribution over z separated from pi, mu, and sigma. So that's the assumption we're going to plug in. That's the only thing we impose on our approximation. We say there will be some q. I don't know yet what the q is, but it'll have to have the property that the z's are independent under q from the pi's and the mu's and the sigma's. And maybe here's a moment where it's, it pays off to reflect a bit on what this actually means, philosophically speaking. Right? It seems like a weird thing to do to say, well, but if I make the z's independent of the pi music, there's a completely different model, no? Right? But the cool thing is we're going to build, through variational inference, the best possible approximation for such a factorizing distribution to the actual distribution under which they are not independent. And so, yes, of course, this model is very different from the real one, but it's going to be the best one of that type compared to the real one. And we're just going to make sure through variational inference that we get very close to it. Question. Ah, no. So, so here, remember, remember that when you when, when we write p off or q off something for probability distributions, um, I, on like lecture three, I had this slide on notation that probability distributions are things that know their inputs. They, they reflect, right? So this Q is not the same as this Q, which wouldn't make sense. Just like, just like in up here, right, this P is not the same as this P. It's, it's just some thing, some distribution, which we'll call Q of Z. Okay, so now starts the process of doing the tedious math. So from the, from the recipe, I'll go back again. Sorry for hopping around a bit. The recipe says to find your optimal Q, you have to write down the logarithm of the joint and then compute expected values under the other Qs. Ah, so here we only have two Qs now. We only have the Q of Z and the Q of pi, mu, and sigma. So we will need to do two steps. First, to get Q of Z, we need to compute the expected value of the log joint under the other Q but the one over pi, mu, and sigma. And then we have to swap roles. And to find the Q of mu, sigma, and pi, we have to compute the expected value of the same thing, the log joint, under Q of z. And if we've written them both down, hopefully, we'll find some structure that then we can then use. And this is where the magic happens. So now, just if you just wait one moment, here comes the, ma here comes the magic. So, OK, so let's first look at this joint. So we can go back one slide again and see how do we actually generate x and z and pi and mu and sigma. Well, we first draw pi. Let me go back. Here we go. So here is, this is the joint. This is the line. Right? So this thing, p of x and z and pi and mu and sigma, is this. We said we first draw pi, then we draw sigma, then we draw mu from given sigma, and then we draw x and z given pi and mu and sigma. So if we want to construct an, our approximation for q of z, we need to take the logarithm of this. So that's a sum over this plus this plus this plus this with a logarithm in front. And compute the expected value under um, q of pi, mu, and sigma. Now, there's going to be a term here where we have to compute an expected value of log of pi under q of pi. But we don't care, because it's just going to be a constant. There's no z in that term. And there's going to be a term here where we have to take a, an expectation over the logarithm of p of mu and sigma under q of mu and sigma and pi. But we don't care, because there's no z in that term. The only term that actually matters for our function on z is the logarithm of this thing 
And then we need to take the expected value under pi and mu and sigma. So now we go up here. Here is this, this is the, the business end of this model. The, the probability for the, for the individual data, x and uh, z, is this mixture model. So it's a product over all of the data x and a product over all of the components, pi raised to the z n kth power, uh, the k subscript here is maybe not needed, um, times a Gaussian over um, x n given the parameters of this, com of this uh, mixture component. So that's the thing that we need to take the logarithm of to, and then compute the expected value under Q of mu and pi and sigma. So when we take a logarithm, those two products will become a sum, a sum over the logarithm of this plus the logarithm of a Gaussian with each with a z and k in front. And that's what I've done here. So we need to take the expected value of the log of this, which separates into a probability for z given pi, times uh, plus the expected value under uh, Q of mu and sigma of the logarithm of P of x given z. So when you know which datum depends to which cluster, you can then draw x. And for that, you need to know what the components of the cluster are, mu and sigma. And here it is. So that's the big expression in here. And now this is the bit where the squinting of the eyes comes in. <laughs> so this is the thing that is very difficult to do for a computer and that you can do when you've written down things on your A3 sheet of paper. Where you, you are sufficiently far away from the, from the screen to see it, maybe. For me, it's good that I've already done it. We can stare at this expression and think about what this actually is. And so for that, we look at z. So where does the z show up in this equation? Ah, it's only here in the front. There's no z in here. No z, z, no z. It's just a constant z, no z, no z. Only z's here. Ah, and then there's a sum. And this is supposed to be the logarithm. Aha. Uh -huh. So q of z is going to be a product over n, a product over k, something nasty raised to the z n kth power. Yeah. So let's give a name to this nastiness. It's logarithm of something, rho n k. Why n k? Because it's indexed by n and k. It, it, it sort of sits inside of this double for loop. And that means the probability distribution over z is going to be rho n k raised to the z n k. And z n k's are these binary variables that are that sum to one if we sum out over k. So what is this? It's a multinomial distribution, a discrete distribution. Sorry, not multinomial, it's just a discrete distribution. Uh huh. So we've sort of abstracted away all this complication here into just a constant that just says, ah, if you give me r and k, which is given by rho and k normalized, then I have a probability distribution. And I know what the expected values of z are under, under discrete probability distributions. They're just given by r and k. Ah, so first half of our cycle is already built. We know that we're going to get these probability distributions. And so, um, yeah, so just, this is just sort of to remind you that is, uh, no, discrete distributions are, okay, this is maybe, uh, I did this before the, I added this slide before the lecture right away. I should have called this R, K, but whatever. So this is just, and maybe I should have just called this discrete distribution rather than multinomial, because otherwise I would have had to put a normalization constant in front. So this is just sort of, this, that, that's my version of a Wikipedia page. You go there and say, ah, there is a discrete distribution, and it can be written like this with binary values for z, and they sum to one, and it has, its properties are, for example, that the expected value of zk is just rho k. Aha, uh -huh. nice. So um, another thing to note, maybe, as we pass by here, is there's more products here. So what this thing says is every datum is drawn independently and then, well, this, is, this here isn't actually an independence. It's just a, it just looks like independence, but there's a hidden dependence term in the fact that these R and Ks have to sum to one, which isn't sort of visible from this equation. But actually, there's independence here over the data n. And we did not put that in. Well, at least we didn't put it into our variational bound. Right? We didn't claim that the, like, 
that this Q of Z has to be a factorized distribution over the individual Zn. It's just that our model already had this, right? There was already this sum here over n. That's the plate in our graph. And we just inherit it from the, the variational bound just kind of inherits this independence. Uh-huh. So now we have the first half of, our, of our, our job done. And now the second part is to close the loop. Now we need to compute our approximation for Q, like the, the approximation Q over pi and mu and sigma. And so for that, before I actually show you the slide, I'll go back again. I'll look at our recipe that says, the recipe says, now we need to compute our Q star over mu and pi and sigma. For that, we need to take the expected value of the log joint under the other Q. The other Q is now our discrete distribution over the sets. So we go back to our model and say, ah, in this big model, there was, this, is the, this is the joint, Q, X of Z and pi, P of X, Z, pi, mu, sigma, which factorizes like this, where this term is given by this thing up here. We need to take the logarithm of this, and then we need to take the expected value under Q of Z, and then write it as a function over pi and mu and sigma and see if we can find structure in it. So now we are not going to be able to drop these terms because they actually depend on pi and mu and sigma. So even though in those terms there is no z, we still need to leave them in because they tell us what q of pi and mu and sigma is going to be. And now we need to take the whole thing, pretty much. So we take the logarithm of this and need to compute the expected value under q of z. The only thing where we're going to save some stress is that when we take the expected value over Q of Z, only this term will actually matter, right? Because there's no Z in here. But we leave it in so that we see the functional relationship on pi and mu and sigma. And I'll actually only do one half of that, and then the other bit is just too tedious, so I'll just tell you how it works. So here we go. Um, let's not look at this here up yet, yet. I'm just defining a bunch of constants. I'll tell you in a moment. So to find our approximate distribution over pi and mu and sigma, we take the expected value under the other Q for the logarithm of the joint. And that, so that's the line from the recipe. Now we look at the joint. We see that it factorizes into this P of pi, which is a Dirichlet, given alpha, plus P of mu and sigma, given the parameters of the Gaussian inverse Vichar plus log of p of z given pi, plus log of p of x given z and mu and sigma. And there's no pi in there, actually, because once you know the z's, you, know, uh, you don't need pi anymore, because it's a chain graph, right? So we notice that this thing does not depend on z, so we can take it outside of the integral. This thing does not depend on z, so we can take it outside of the integral. These things, this thing depends on z, so we have to leave the integral in. But there is at least a sum here. So now we are going to have two different integrals, this one and then this one. So this is the first one, and here's the second one down here. And um, here I've already plugged in the actual structure of this log. Um, so I can go back to the corresponding slide, but you might also remember that the, the mixture model has this component pi raised to the z and k, and then Gaussian over x given mu and, mu and sigma k raised to the z and k. So this has now already come down. Um, OK, so I'll take this line, this last line. This is actually two lines, but the last equation. And move it up to the next slide, because there's not enough space, because I don't have an A3 sheet and a sharp pencil, so I need to put it on multiple. Uh -huh. No, it's gone. OK, well, I'll just point with my hand. And now we see that actually, if you look at where pi and mu and sigma show up in this expression, we notice that at the, at the top, OK, I'll move my mouse. Here is a term that depends on pi. Here is a term that depends on mu and sigma. Here is a term that depends on pi. We've integrated out z. And here is a term that depends on mu and sigma. But there's no mixing term. There's no point where the pi's and the mu's come together. So this is supposed to be the logarithm of our joint distribution over pi and mu and sigma. 
So when we take the, expect, the, expect, the exponential of it, we're going to get one term in pi, which would involve the exponential of this, time, this thing times the exponential of this thing. And one, one term in mu and sigma, which would involve the exponential of this times the exponential of this. Which is interesting because this means this thing factorizes into one part in pi and one in mu and sigma. But we didn't require this. We didn't tell our approximation method that we wanted to have this factorization. It just so happened. This is called induced factorization. It's something that comes in from our model structure. It's also something that I already sort of waved my hand about, right? If you know which datum belongs to which cluster, then you can estimate the components of the cluster without knowing pi, and you can estimate pi without knowing the clusters. So let's think about pi first, the distribution on pi. Well, for that, we need to take, here's again the rule, to find the optimal distribution on pi, we need to take the expected value under Q of Z of the log of the joint. So we look at this thing up here, we realize that these two terms don't matter. So we can get rid of them. We only need to take the expected value of the log of this plus this. So there's no expected, expected value here because there's no Z in here. We only have an expected value here. So it's this. It's the log of P of pi, which is a Dirichlet distribution, plus the expected value of the log of P of Z given pi. So P of Z given pi is a um, discrete distribution. Actually, it's a multinomial distribution. So how many sets, like what are, the, what are the, the, the probabilities for the sets given pi are just pi for the corresponding sets. And the logarithm of a Dirichlet is just, you might remember, the Dirichlet distribution, actually I have a slide on this, so the Dirichlet distribution looks like this. On Wikipedia, you can find the Dirichlet is defined with this probability density function, where there's this, this annoying normalization constant that's called the beta function. And then people tend to use this alpha hat thing, which is the sum of all of the alphas. It's just a convenient notation. And so that's the, the, this is the logarithm of it. And it all has all sorts of beautiful properties. Like we know its expected value, its variance, its covariance, its mode, the expected value of the logarithm of pi, the entropy, and lots and lots of other things. So we might sort of read this and say, oh, okay, maybe we can come back to this and it might be useful, so let's think about this. The logarithm of a Dirichlet is therefore, so from the previous slide, right, it's sum over alpha minus one times logarithm of pi plus a constant. So, uh, oops, sorry, wrong line, here we go. It's alpha minus one times sum over the logarithm of pi k. Now, if all the alphas, uh, if alpha was actually uh, like a vector with individual components, it would be inside of the sum, under the prior, we might assume we just have one constant alpha, so we can drag it outside of the sum. And the logarithm of this discrete distribution is just this. It's just the sum over the individual clusters and over all the n's, r and k, logarithm pi. Well, actually, it's the sum over the z and k log pi k, but I've already taken the expected value, because the expected value of the random variable z under the discrete distribution with probability r is just r. That was two slides ago. So here, we've essentially closed the loop. We use the fact that we have the other approximating distribution, the discrete thing on z, to construct an, ex an exact expression for the expected value in the variational bound. And now we can look at this and see, oh, so what kind of function is this actually? This is where you take your step back and say, ah, there's a logarithm of pi here and there, and a big sum over k. So we can move the sum outside, collapse, it's just one term in log pi with alpha minus one plus the sum over n, r, n, k. So let's give a name to this sum over n, r, n, k. Let's call it n, k. It's the number, the expected number of points in cluster k. And now we just have here alpha plus n, k minus one times the logarithm over pi k. Ah, and that's the logarithm of a Dirichlet distribution. So our approximating distribution on pi is going to be a Dirichlet distribution because Dirichlets are given by product over k pi k raised to some power. There it is. So we know what our approximating thing for pi is going to be. And now um, we might 
sort of gather some hope if you go back to two slides ago where we had this nasty thing here, this nasty expression for log of rho and k, that we might be able to actually compute this expected value over q of pi uh, of log of pi k. Why? Because we can go to our Wikipedia slide and say, well, what are the properties of a Dirichlet? Does it have something about the expected value of the log of the... Ah, here it is. The expected value of the logarithm of pi is, uh, what is the, uh, this is the di gamma function. It's the derivative of the log of the gamma function. Nasty thing. Who knows what this is? Ah, it's available in Python. So whatever, right? So here is we are saved by living in 2023. Someone has already written the code for us to do it. We don't have to think about what this nasty function is. It's just there. So the last thing that's left, the only thing we actually need to deal with is this other expected value. And here I'm going to wave my hands around a little bit. So we, we still do need to think about the expected value under Z and K of the bits that depend on mu and sigma. So this is the prior on mu and sigma plus the expected value of this logarithm of a Gaussian distribution under uh, Z and K. And you'll actually, if you do this, and then it gets really tedious, now you have a lot of long expressions on your A3 sheet of paper, you realize that what you have in front of you is actually, just like we just had the logarithm of a Dirichlet distribution, you have the logarithm of a Gauss inverse Vichar. But you may remember that this Gauss inverse Vichar expression is this really tedious long thing that you had to deal with once in an exercise sheet. So I'm not going to show it to you again. It's just this really long expression. And we find that it also, just like for the Dirichlet, we had this simple update where we just have to add nk, there's gonna be a similar update for the Gaussian inverse Vichar that just involves annoyingly more quantities to compute. But I'll tell you what they are. So we need to compute the expected number of observations we've made in cluster nk. Those are the counts for our Vichar prior. We need to compute expected sample means. So what is x bar? x bar is the sum over the um, x n weighted by r n k. It was on a slide ago that I'm not, yeah, okay. So it's up here, it's this thing. And then we also need this um, first form of kind of square distance to the sample mean, which is used to estimate the, um, the covariances. And then you may remember from your homework that this is actually the beautiful bit about the Vichar uh, Gauss inverse Vichar mechanism that there's an extra term here that also captures how far the data, the observed data mean is from the prior mean and increases the estimate for the variance if, uh, sorry, for the precision if those numbers are large. Why? Because if you see data that is broadly distributed, then you're going to underestimate its variance because you're actually estimating a large mean and therefore you need to have an extra term. Okay, so that's an update line. Huh? So the main, thing, the main thing about this is that you can find on Wikipedia how to compute the expected value, it's still not working, the expected value of um, the logarithm of a Gaussian under um, uh, Vichar, actually what do we need? We need to compute our magical, to co close this problem. We need to find the expressions for these last two terms in the sum. So we need to know what under a Gauss inverse Vichar is the expected value of the logarithm of the precision and the expected value of this square distance. And you can find on Wikipedia or in Chris Bishop's book and in various other pieces of text, expressions for this thing. They just happen to be available. And that means we can build an update. And for that, I have an actual slide that says, close the loop by setting Q of Z to the discrete distribution involving um, the parameters given by this expression, which can be computed from the other end of the approximation. So we know that this is a Dirichlet, so therefore the expected value of log of pi is something involving digamma functions that we can call with scipy.special.digamma. 
and the expected value of the logarithm of a precision um, matrix under a Vichar is also given by something nasty with a digamma function plus a bunch of logarithms and, uh, oh, there should probably be a two pi here, plus log of um, determinant of the parameters, wk. And the expected value of a square distance under a Gauss inverse Vichar is, again, something we can actually estimate. And now we have update equations that we can implement. So we can write a, a set of, like a while loop that iterates between two and doing two things one after the other. It constructs an approximate discrete distribution on, uh, sorry, first an approximate Gauss inverse Vichar distribution using, uh, no, first an approximate discrete distribution, here we go, um, using the, the exponential of the line from the previous slide. So you take the individual terms in the exponential and then or with a logarithm in front, and then you take the exponential afterwards. Um, and then you normalize. There's this proportional sign here, so you need to normalize. Actually, there's a fun little trick in Python. If you want to take such an expression, where well, you've computed the logarithm, and now you want to take the exponential and then normalize, that's the same as the softmax. So you just call the softmax on the log, right? Because that's the exponential divided by the sum of the exponentials. And um, then we construct an estimate for, this isn't even on the slide, for it's on the previous slide, for this Gauss inverse Vichar. And then we keep iterating. And we keep checking how the variables change, the, the, the estimates change. One way to do that, again, is to check the parameters we are optimizing and just see how they evolve and whether they converge at some point. Another one is to actually write down the elbow, which we can, it involves all of these complicated terms, and just see that it rises and go, goes to some point, and then it just stops. Um, and why would you do that? Well, one of the nice things about this is that you can use it to estimate the number of components. There was actually a big selling point for these kind of models for a while. In early, sort of around 27, 28, 9, 10, there was a whole explosion of um, models with infinite degrees of freedom using variational and uh, sampling probabilistic formalisms. The very first one actually was, in my, at least as far as I know, in the machine learning community on Gaussian mixture models. It was called the infinite Gaussian mixture model. Uh, it came from Karl Rasmussen and Zubin Garamani here in Tübingen in Cambridge, um, uh, which basically showed what I'm going to show you. So what you can do with these kind of models is you can initialize um, on this data set with, in this case, I've taken six clusters. So there are six Gaussians here. One, two, three, four, five, where's the sixth one? I don't know. And what I'm doing in this plot is that these individual clusters have an alpha value. So they are transparent. Where the transparency is chosen to be proportional to their probability under the, post the variational posterior for the corresponding component pi. So if they are completely transparent, then they have a very low probability. And if they are dark red, they have a high probability. And I've initially drawn them from um, some kind of empirical Bayesian prior. So what I've done is I've computed the mean and the variance of the data set and just drawn the clusters from the initializations of the cluster means from um, the, uh, this distribution, from this kind of Gaussian distribution, and drawn from a Dirichlet to have initial weights. Why do I need to do that? Because if I would set them all to the same thing initially, in one point in the middle, then they would all get the same update under the variational update. And they would all move to the same point and then get stuck there, and that would not work. So we have to, what's called, break the symmetry initially by adding some randomness, but only once. And then after that, there is no sampling involved. It's just a bunch of optimization steps where the algorithm decides that it would like to use only two clusters. It has like faded out all the other ones. It says two is enough, um, and here is your cluster means. So, and that's just one of the many nice things about this. Why would we use this framework? Let me first summarize a bit. So, variational inference is maybe a tool from a more civilized age. Um, these are your father's variational bounds. Um, a general framework to construct approximating probability distributions when you can't compute the posterior directly. 
And they work by minimizing the KL divergence, the kubler leibert divergence, between the approximation and the true posterior, which is the same as maximizing the evidence lower bound for a fixed model, by making this kind of maximization tractable not by parameterizing the distribution, but by imposing factorizations, imposing product structure on the probability distribution, and then analytically, iteratively updating the, um, these, these components in the variational bound to locally minimize KL divergence, and that amounts to setting them to this value. Setting means that like, this value means the expected value under the other parts of the approximation for the logarithm of the joint. And to make this actually work in practice, you need to first write down what this log joint is. So you need to build a model. You don't get around that, of course. Then you impose the factorization. So you say in which kind of schedule you want to go through the data. Then you need to expect, you have to inspect what this function then actually looks like in terms of its algebraic form. So you leave the integrals in, but you just look at how things functionally depend on each other detect, hopefully, that they amount to certain known exponential families that you can find on Wikipedia, and then hope that you can find the necessary terms in here in analytic form on Wikipedia. And so the question I got during the break was, how do I know that this will work? And the simple answer is, you don't really. You have to do it. You have to sit down and actually do the math. And that's also why it maybe fell out of, out of favor, because it's much more tempting to just say, ah, it's just train a deep neural network. Let's buy a bunch of GPUs and just, yeah, it'll somehow work. Rather than pay someone of, like, there aren't, aren't many people in the world who are able to do this. I mean, there are actually by now more than a few handfuls, but still not enough to satisfy the needs of industry. Um, and uh, they have to actually spend some time in front of a piece of paper rather than provide code. But there are a few sort of ways to automate this. So one thing to observe is you get to choose, in a sense, how good the approximation is going to be by imposing more or less factorization. So by deciding to use more or less terms in here to break dependence between variables, you can make your life easier by moving more integrals out into the bits that just make a, fact, make a parameterization of your, not a parameterization, give an algebraic form of your approximation. So, um, and the other thing you can do is you can just decide to use exponential families everywhere because then things tend to work out a bit better. And so there is actually a framework called variational message passing that is uh, due to a combination of people like Chris Bishop and David Mackay and John Wynn and Tom Minka and a few others that uh, boils down to effectively saying, A, we're going to factorize everything. So every single variable in our code will have its own distribution. That's the full mean field idea. B, we're going to only use exponential family distributions, of which we have a very finite small collection. And we're going to use the standard ones. So if you have a probability distribution, you assign a Dirichlet. If you have um, a real value thing, you assign a Gaussian. If you have a positive definite thing, you assign a Vichar, and so on and so on. And then you're almost done. Now, if you restrict yourself to models that only involve certain types of interaction between the Zs, not the Xs. The Xs are fine, because they can, you can mask them away by some feature functions. But only certain types of interactions between the Zs, typically linear, but maybe log linear, then you can actually be guaranteed that you can automatically construct your variational bound. And this is the idea behind uh, the infer.net toolbox that Microsoft built more than a decade ago, and which maybe in hindsight didn't take off as much as it could have had. So you saw that this is a tedious and maybe painful pro process to do, and I realize that it's maybe not so much fun to watch me do this, and that's maybe why it didn't really take off and also why I do it at the end of this, um, uh, of this lecture course, right before the exam, if you like, um, because we first had to maybe do all the things that you now expect in 2023 to cover in a course on machine learning, deep learning, and regression, and unsupervised learning, and so on. And 
what I showed you today is maybe, yeah, a blast from the past of how these models used to be constructed. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't think about these kind of approximations anymore. It's just that they maybe aren't the first tool in your toolbox. So variational inference, I wrote here, is a powerful tool. It's a very powerful tool, actually, because it works in the way that computers are supposed to work. You, once you've implemented the variational bound, there is no surprises anymore. It just converges. It just works pretty much all the damn time um, if you set it up correctly. It requires a lot of knowledge, expert knowledge to construct. You need to know about exponential families. You need to know about graphical models. You need to know all the properties of exponential families. You need to know about scheduling and stabilization of your uh, iterative optimization routine. And you need to monitor it. And you need to initialize it correctly, and so on and so on. But then it just works. So people used to joke. It used to be this thing for, for computer science or machine learning PhD students that sooner or later, once you've set up your model, your advisor would tell you to build a variational bound to make it actually work, because you had fiddled around with some approximate thing, and it didn't work, and it, oh, no, I've lost too much time. And then you did some sampling. So like, there's this other piece, basically piece of toolkit that's also general called Markov Chain Monte Carlo that I didn't cover in this, in this course, which is just sampling, pretty much. And that you can just call a Markov Chain Monte Carlo sampler, and then it just runs forever. It takes forever and ever, but then eventually it produces some interesting samples. And, and your advisor used to tell you, ah, now is the time to sit down and actually do this derivation for the variational bound. And it was very painful to do. And then I haven't even told you that, of course, at the end, you also have to implement this thing. So I actually have a piece of Python code for this Gaussian mixture model, but I'm not going to show it to you because it's like this long and just a lot, a lot of jacks, so you won't be able to parse it anyway. And of course, you would make bugs when you do this. So I had once during my PhD a three-week-long period where I couldn't make any progress because I had a big bug in my variational bound. And it ended with me inviting another PhD student to stay with me after hours. And I brought along two bottles of wine. And we spent the entire evening in a lecture hall completely covering blackboards, me slowly covering them, reading off what I've done, and him just sitting there really slowly checking every single line. And after two hours, we found the bug. I don't even remember what it was. Some minus, some something, there's a minus one missing or whatever, and it just like suddenly worked. So machine learning used to be like this. It used to be hunting for bugs in math. Now it's you know, trying to reduce your learning rate. Well, OK, so um, I'll leave it at that. On Thursday, I will actually try and do a little bit of a history, history lecture, just as the end closing thing um, of, of terms. So there's going to be no new content. I hope that you nevertheless um, enjoyed today's Highbrow math lecture, give some feedback, and I'll see you on Thursday.